matter very carefully and has uh, culled a lot of information from around the state. Um, as the PORAC Legal Defense Fund Administrator, I'm responsible for essentially overseeing thousands of cases a year where officers are accused of misconduct. PORAC fully supports the use of body-worn cameras <coughs> to be used and implemented responsibly. And as everybody has spoken before me, has already described the key issues of what responsibly means. The concept of body-worn cameras is the greatest tool possible to provide transparency in policing to the street-level patrols that occur between law enforcement and its community. Body-worn cameras and other recording devices have been around for years. Uh, PORAC welcomes the influx of body-worn cameras to its membership. I'm going to turn to the responsible aspect as well, again. An officer responding to a domestic violence call and seeing the victim bloodied, beaten, and bruised. That's captured on video. That should not be uploaded to YouTube that evening for the community to see. An officer doing a field interview of a child rape victim who's staring into the chest of this officer right into the camera, fearing reprisals and retribution. Rules need to be put into place as to when that camera can be turned off and when it's required to be turned on. A body-worn camera, just like any implement on the officer's Sam Brown belt, is a tool and should be used only following proper procedures put in place, training, and oversight. Taking these matters into consideration, PORAC has drafted potential legislation for this committee to consider. The first and most important is to cover and address privacy. I've heard speakers before me talk about an entire wholesale exclusion of the public's right to access videos that are recorded by body-worn cameras. PORAC is recommending a less broad brush approach, recognizing that there needs to be a balance between the public's right to know, the public's right to have access, and the safety and the privacy of police and the citizens. The first concept is to add to the public California Public Record Act an express provision declaring that audio or video recordings taken by law enforcement can constitute files of an active investigation so they don't have to be released if they are truly an active investigation. The second suggested change is to add the word victims as opposed to just any other persons for their safety. The third is to provide an absolute right of a department to not disclose audio or video recordings pursuant to Public Records Act request if either the safety or the privacy of any person would be jeopardized or compromised. In this way, the public still has the right to request, and unless there is the safety or the privacy of a victim or other person at issue and placed in jeopardy, that, video, that recording should be released to the public. The last aspect of privacy is that the death or serious bodily injury of any person that is depicted on a video recording should not be disclosed and should be exempt from disclosure under the Public Record Act. Other suggested changes offered by PORAC is a modification to POBAR to allow officers to have five days notice before any video taken by them or of them is released to the public. PORAC reviewed the various concerns about when the recording should be turned on and turned off, uh, what level of training should be had, what retention should be had, and we recognize that there may not be a one-size-fits-all answer at the state level. PORAC is then recommending that at the state level, the state require that any department or agency that is going to mandate or require the use of body-worn cameras for its officers must first meet and confer as to the impact with the rank and file police office who will be wearing these devices and interacting with the public. At that local level, decisions such as 
when it should be used, the level of training, the type of review afterwards, whether it could be used for training purposes or discipline afterwards. At the local level, it is best addressed there because what may be appropriate in Los Angeles County might not be the same as appropriate in Siskiyou County. The type of retention that may be necessary in one city may be different in another given its peculiar needs. The other benefit about having things handled at the local level for these issues, it will allow for a fluid and ease of readjustment as necessary. I want to reiterate that PORAC is fully supportive of the use of body-worn cameras to be used and implemented responsibly. And one item that I have not addressed, which I'll leave to everybody else, is the cost, which will be significant, if not substantial. I thank you, and I remain available for any questions. Um, and I would like to say uh, we really appreciate, Mr. Fishman, that PORAC is making specific suggestions. Have you uh, trans uh, given those over to our committee staff now? They have. Yes. Been. Oh, great. No, it, it really will help if we have a starting point that you suggest. Uh, Mr. Ingmanson uh, also would appreciate um, any specific uh, interests that the Los Angeles Police Protective League has as well. Yes, we submitted a, uh, a bullet point and a, and a statement to you. Great. Uh, hopefully Thank you. you have. All right. Mr. Bibring, uh, could you um, particularly address uh, the uh, uh, comments here by uh, uh, Attorney uh, Fishman and Ingmanson? as well as whatever specific uh, items you came ahead to uh, here to talk to us about. Certainly, and I, I, there are definitely a number of points on which uh, the ACLU and the Police Protective League and, and PORAC agree, which may be surprising to some people, but we do. I'm very glad to hear it. It will um, make our job much easier. So um, let me start in thanking this committee and, and members and, and Mr. Chairman. Um, Body-worn cameras, in the end, are a surveillance technology, and too often surveillance technologies are deployed by local police departments without the careful thought about uh, the privacy implications and the right balance between public safety and privacy that is being given by this committee uh, here today, decisions about uh, when data can be collected, who has access to it, when it's released to the public, what kind of security measures are in place to protect that data. Um, and let me s start by noting that one of the most basic protections for privacy that can be uh, uh, instituted, implemented, uh, at a local level is to require local departments to put in place a clear policy on body-worn video um, before they are body-worn video is deployed. And actually, that's a, that's a requirement that is true of any surveillance technology, from uh, license plate readers to drones or, or other kind of video surveillance. Um, as a starting place of our agreement uh, with uh, the former speakers, um, I, the ACLU recognizes that body cameras are a tool, and uh, they hold great promise. The initial studies are promising, and as, as uh, Mr. Chairman, you recognized earlier, um, it's not while it's not clear that those results will translate across every jurisdiction from uh, large urban departments to small rural departments, they are promising. Um, but how those tools use the policies that are in place determine whether they will be effective, less effective, or actually uh, undercut the values of accountability and transparency that they're meant to promote. And I should um, start by noting that although the ACLU is, is certainly supportive of, of body cameras, there are community groups um, in Los Angeles that uh, for whom the, the privacy concerns actually outweigh the potential public safety benefits and have been on record as opposing body cameras because of concerns that, that um, they will be used as a surveillance tool, that the video will be used to exonerate officers but withheld when it is um, incriminating. And, and so I think it's, it's also important to recognize that there is a diversity of viewpoint um, in the state. Um, I'll start by focusing on uh, privacy issues uh, per the subject of this panel. Um, and by indicating that the, the, the first stage of, of privacy concerns is at the recording, what, what events can be recorded. And um, with respect to officers, it's the position of the ACLU and certainly the, the, the weight of um, case law in the courts that officers don't have a privacy interest in their interactions with public, the public while they're on duty. 
Um, but that doesn't mean that there are no privacy concerns raised by body cameras, as the former speakers um, indicated. Um, the ACLU certainly favors uh, mandatory recording of most, if not all, interactions with members of the public. Um, there are certainly narrow exemptions that can be made for sensitive situations, uh, uh, certain child victims of, of sexual assault, for example, or even private places like recording in the home. But in order to ensure accountability, permission uh, to turn off the camera should be obtained in advance and obtained on camera um, wherever possible. Um, also, with respect to recording, notice should be provided to people uh, wherever practical that video is being recorded. Obviously, that can interfere with the course of an investigation, so simply uh, labeling a camera with a, a plaque that says that, that the interaction, interactions will be recorded um, could achieve some of that purpose. Obviously, surreptitious recording is more invasive than open and public recording, and so th that privacy concern can be addressed uh, easily, and also informing uh, civilians that they're being recorded s helps further the deterrence value uh, of cameras in, in de-escalating situations. People will behave less aggressively, uh, as the Rialto study shows, when they know they're being recorded. Um, a second area of private, important privacy protections has to do with the limitations on use and access uh, by the department to, to video. Um, Departments should not a should access video only for a handful of specified reasons. First of all, when there's some reason to believe that there is misconduct or, or criminal acts captured on the video, either um, with an officer from a, a civilian complaint or some kind of a, a use of force that has triggered an investigation, um, or uh, where there's civilian conduct that's uh, criminal in nature captured on the video. Um, also with respect to, to randomized audits to ensure that training is being followed. Um, or corrective action, if an officer is required to um, be monitored, uh, an officer can be, should be able to be required to be monitored uh, through video if there's a history of, uh, of problems and that monitoring is part of a corrective action plan. Um, one of the areas where uh, we agree completely with the Protective League is with respect to uh, a clear ban on fishing expeditions, whether it's the, the officer that uh, Mr. Ingmanson referred to earlier um, that was essentially subjected to a fishing expedition where su supervising officers went through uh, hours and hours and hours of video looking for minor violations, or civilians, um, if there's a, a protest against the mayor's policy, um, that video shouldn't be subject to review uh, after the fact for minor violations that might be charged. Um, and in fact, uh, Policy should go further uh, and bar any review uh, absent uh, either randomized, outside of a randomized audit or a particularized suspicion. Certainly video should not be used to build uh, dossiers or gather information on members of the, pub of the public, for example, at that, at that protest of, hypothetical protest of a mayor's policies. Um, last, the issue of public access to uh, to video is, is a crucial one and one where obviously the, the values of transparency and public access to government information are in tension with privacy. Um, I do want to make the point, transparency is not the same as accountability here. Um, a, a police department can have a, a functioning, a well-functioning disciplinary system, but if it's not transparent, if everything is hidden from public view, the public may not have confidence in that disciplinary system. Um, in the end, if, if police departments keep video secret, the public, some segments of the public will believe that they're doing that because there's something to hide. And, and it's, so it's particularly important that there be meaningful access uh, to public uh, video. Now there are a couple of um, uh, issues here. I mean, one is a legal issue. Um, as this panel has already heard, there's some ambiguity in the interpretation of the investigative records of exemption to the PRA. And, uh, uh, government code 6254F, so that some departments believe that a great deal of the information must be disclosed and others um, believe that a great deal is, is uh, properly withheld. But I would point out that the investigations exemption isn't intended to balance privacy and transparency, and in fact sets up uh, perhaps the, the wrong incentive structure or the wrong result where Incidents where there's the highest public interest, where there's a sh police-involved shooting, for example, are unquestionably going to be the subjects of investigation, and so those would be um, 
withheld, whereas uh, incidents with the lowest public interest, where people are requesting video of why the police were out to their neighbor's house or what happened when their spouse was stopped uh, for a traffic stop a few weeks ago, um, that those would not be withheld under the investigative records exemption. And so um, there may be legislative work to be done to, to tailor that the Public Records Act to the right balance between privacy and, uh, and transparency. From a policy perspective, um, it, it is crucial that um, there be public access uh, to those records, to the to video, particularly of critical incidents. And there are a few um, approaches that various jurisdictions have taken that it's, are worth calling attention to. There's the blurring um, that uh, Professor Eberhardt mentioned that Seattle has implemented and in fact is available for viewing as of yesterday. It's not clear that as a technical matter that that is going to uh, obscure privacy sufficiently to uh, obscure the video sufficiently to protect privacy while allowing enough transparency to to really understand what is going on. Um, there is case by case review, of course, uh, as is currently happening in Oakland, uh, where where officers are reviewing the video. But it's not clear that obviously that's time intensive, resource intensive. But it's also not clear that there's a legal basis for withholding um, video that is highly private, other than the catch all exemption of the PRA. Um, one solution that has not been addressed that I, I want to call attention to is the the potential to release video uh, only to individuals who appear on that video, and that would allow those individuals to make a decision about whether uh, their privacy interests um, are, are implicated and, and justify withholding the video, or whether it could be distributed if there's some uh, uh, potential misconduct. Um, a mandatory release of video to people who appear on the video, or, or at least have a significant interaction with an officer, um, would not necessarily waive the rights of the department to withhold under the Public Records Act, because disclosures required by law um, do not waive exemptions. Um, and then finally, the Public Records Act could be uh, redrawn to, to allow release of certain categories or to mandate release of certain categories. For example, uh, critical incidents where there is a use of deadly force um, or allegations of serious misconduct. Um, in closing, I wanted to address one issue that's uh, outside the privacy um, concern, and that is the issue of, because it's come up several times today, the issue of officer access to, uh, to video footage before making a statement. I want to be clear, um, the ACLU strongly opposes that, and I think that that significantly undercuts the accountability justification of cameras. Um, both the LAPD publicly and here today has said that they don't want to release video to the public because it might taint investigation. That rationale applies equally to the officers involved. And nobody's saying that the officers shouldn't be allowed to view the video and to respond to the video. But before they make a, a first statement in order, as uh, Chief Went said earlier, to capture the officer's state of mind uh, rather than what he or she has seen on the video, it's crucial that, uh, that the officer make that first statement before reviewing the video that's particularly true where that where nobody else is given access yeah. to the video before yeah. they make statements. All right. Uh, you've, I'm hoping you're finished with yes. your testimony. You went a little bit over. Um, what you said is a lot less clear than what I've heard from attorneys Fishman and Ingmanson. Uh, if you don't allow fishing expeditions, which I would agree is at least expensive and perhaps not appropriate, how then can you release video um, and what would constitute a fishing expedition rather than simple release to the public. It, it's just not at all clear to me. Well, I think uh, particularly the public has the strongest interest in access to video where there is an incident involved and where there's a, a certainly a critical incident, but other allegations of misconduct, any of those would qualify as not a fishing expedition because there's reason to believe that there may be misconduct, whether that's because there's an allegation of misconduct or there's an, there's an incident that has happened that triggers a mandatory investigation. But you've also said under those circumstances it's an investigation, so it would not necessarily be released. Well, as a, yes, as a descriptive matter of what the current state of the law is, that may be true, and, and my point is that 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 is not well matched to balancing privacy and public oh, okay. so access concerns. So you would, concerns. in these highest profile incidents, you would uh, call for release of the video? 
unquestionably. And there, there may be um, some time delay that's required, a minimal time delay that's required to, to allow the initial investigative steps. But, but absolutely, the video should ultimately be released. And that shouldn't be left to the vagaries of the court process, because court cases can settle and videos can remain. Um, I'm sure we'll have some interesting discussions on that. Um, Assembly Member uh, Alejo and Vice Chair Melendez, do you have uh, some questions? You're good, uh, Alejo? All right, thank you very much, uh, excellent. Um, again, uh, Attorney Bibring, if, you can, if you've uh, gotten specific proposals to our uh, public safety staff as the uh, uh, PORAC and P uh, LA Police Protective League have done, that would be very helpful to us. Thank you. Uh, we've submitted some materials already, but I will serve Great. Back. Thank you. All right. So. Uh